I was asked to talk about alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures uh, in the Southeast. And as he mentioned, I've been doing this uh, since 2016 uh, here at the University of Georgia Tifton campus. Uh, I have a producer driven applied research program, uh, which means that the work that I do, I, I, I build that based on questions from our producers and I try to get results quickly to uh, give application for those producers uh, in the region. So we're very applied down here uh, at the Tifton campus and a big focus of our program is uh, alfalfa integration into Bermuda grass and alfalfa utilization uh, in this part of or this region of the United States. Uh, so in 2016, uh, we started a project where we were integrating alfalfa into Bermuda grass as a baleage option. Um, there were several demonstrations already occurring across the, uh, the, the state as well as across the region uh, in various Bermuda grass varieties. Uh, but we, at the, to that day, we didn't have any alfalfa that had been interceded into Tifton 85 Bermuda grass. Uh, and some of the concern was that Tifton 85 was such a robust Bermuda grass that alfalfa may not be able to compete with that. Uh, so we decided to put this into a, a test and, and put this into a research evaluation. Uh, and we did this using an existing Tipton 85 Bermuda grass field here at the University of Tipton, Georgia Tipton campus. Uh, and we interceded following our UGA recommendations using Bulldog 805 alfalfa. Uh, we usually recommend between 15 and 20 pounds to the acre, and we recommend planting that on a 14 inch row spacing. Uh, previous work had determined that a seven inch row spacing was too close and would shade out the Bermuda grass component. And with Tipton 85, we did not want to see uh, that Bermuda grass leaving our stand. Uh, and when you go much further past that 14 inch row spacing onto more like a 20 inch row spacing, uh, the alfalfa just can't compete with those robust Bermuda grass forages. So 14 inch seems to be our sweet spot. Uh, we harvest our alfalfa mixtures uh, when our alfalfa reaches 10% bloom stage or on a 28 to 35 day interval. And we do wait for that very first harvest after establishment until we get to at least a 25% bloom stage just to help with that root development and carbohydrate reserves. And so we followed all of these uh, techniques as we went through with this evaluation. Uh, one of the questions was why did we look at baleage rather than uh, dry hay production or some other use of this system? And that's because we believe baleage is a Southeastern game changer. And we start to think about the integration of these semi to non-dormant alfalfa varieties. We're really extending that use into the early spring as well as into the fall. And in most areas across the Southeast, there's one thing that you can guarantee in those time periods. It's that three days or four days without rain is not possible. And so looking at baleage production and using that for this system really fit well for helping to maintain a high quality forage product to maintain that alfalfa leaf, which is critical uh, to making that higher quality option, as well as being able to get that timely harvest of this crop. And so we've been very pleased with the results uh, from this. Uh, when we were harvesting our baleage, we would uh, begin mowing our fields at 6 p.m. in the evening. And we did that so that those sugars were greater in the evening, we could get that highest sugar component. Uh, we would rake and bale once our moisture hit around 55% moisture, so, since we are making baleage, so you want to be within that 40 to 60% range. And then we would wrap it immediately after baling. Uh, so essentially the hay in a day concept, we just happened to do it overnight. Our day started at six in the evening. Uh, what we really like about the alfalfa Bermuda grass system is that you get an ebb and flow relationship. And so you have that high quality alfalfa product uh, early in the season in that spring time period. It's still contributing in the summer, but we get into summer slump and that's where that Bermuda grass really starts contributing to that system. And then when we go later into the fall, that alfalfa starts to to give more of, of the, that component of that stand. So we really uh, can benefit from this ebb and flow relationship. And we see that, and we'd always talked about it, but when we actually collected data on it, and we see this across uh, all of our projects, uh, we looked at the botanical composition. And uh, with our first year here of 2016, uh, you see that we didn't have, we didn't even have greater than a 30% stand of alfalfa contributing in that very first year. Uh, but we do see that after we get a little summer slump, we get a bump that's coming 
uh, in that fall time period. Uh, it's not uncommon, at least in the Chifton area, after establishment, that you're not going to get utilize, utilization that first year until about May. That's when your 25% bloom is going to hit. However, when you go into 2017, so we get into year two, uh, we really see that that alfalfa, after having that, that winter rest, uh, when we got into March time period, has really uh, made a significant contribution to that stand. Uh, we maintained a high percentage of alfalfa uh, throughout the season, and we also got up to eight cuttings that season. Uh, going into year three, again, we still see a strong component of that alfalfa, but we do see that ebb and flow relationship where that Bermuda grass component uh, starts to really kick off in the June, uh, July, and August time period. I will note that you see a lot of the orange, which is other, and all the, sometimes other is can be weeds that we don't want, uh, but we are pretty fortunate that our volunteer weeds are annual ryegrass and, and crabgrass and uh, a lot of row crop people may not like those, but they're definitely high quality forages, so they still contribute uh, pretty good to our baleage product. But we were very pleased with uh, seeing that and being able to illustrate that ebb and flow relationship we talked about. So after we went through and we uh, collected this data, we really found that there was an advantage uh, of a mixture. And so adding the alfalfa to the Tipton 85 increased our total number of har harvest our uh, annual tonnage, as well as our forage quality uh, off that same use of land if you only had uh, the chipped in 85 Bermuda grass there. Now this has led to the question from a lot of people of how long will alfalfa last in an alfalfa Bermuda grass baleage system? And so we have elected to continue to collect data of some nature off of this plot area. These were some very large plots that we were working with. Uh, and so you can see those first three years, 16, 17, and 18, that was the years of the Baylage project. Uh, and then in 2019, we hit a very significant drought. So we still got six harvests that year, uh, but we didn't get a harvest after August. I think if, if anybody remembers 2019, uh, it rained a little bit in May, maybe a drop or two in June, and then it didn't rain again for several, several months. And so that definitely had a significant impact. However, in 2020, we were able to come back and get another six cuttings across that season. And that really attests to the drought tolerance uh, of the, the alfalfa and, and what it's known for and how it can really be effective in this region. Uh, we are continuing to collect some of that data this year. Uh, we are seeing that the stand is thinning uh, and having some questions uh, as to what is that next step. Uh, but we've been pretty pleased with the production of this particular stand uh, for on going on now six years. Uh, at the same time as we were doing the baleage evaluation, we had another evaluation where we were looking at alfalfa as a nitrogen source under grazing conditions. And so this was again a, a three-way comparison where we had Bermuda grass alfalfa interceded with Bulldog 805 alfalfa, uh, Bermuda grass that received the split application of nitrogen twice across the growing season and Bermuda grass with no additional nitrogen additive. Now, all other uh, factors were equal, uh, nutrients that were applied, soil test uh, recommendations, all of those were the same, only the nitrogen component was different. We were able to graze these plots uh, with four to five weight stalker steers and we used rotational grazing. In this uh, project, we had a two acre paddock that we split into three sections and we grazed each section for seven to 10 days and then allowed for a 14 to 20 day rest period per section. And uh, one of the unique things, this was again in the year that I started and we did, hadn't finished our um, grazing paddocks that's at the Better Grazing Program now. And so we had a completely temporary system, including our water lines, our pens, everything that we used was completely temporary. So the benefit uh, from this was not only that we got to evaluate alfalfa Bermuda grass under grazing, but we also got to evaluate some differences in fencing techniques and utilizing temporary fencing. Uh, so that became a, it's become a big component of, uh, of our, our research here. Uh, so for this project, uh, looking at our total days of grazing, we did start in May of each year, uh, but again, uh, 2019 was very dry and so that drought uh, significantly impacted and we had to end that study a little bit early. Uh, so in 2018, we got 122 days of grazing from May through September and we grazed completely through uh, the, the summer time period. 
And in 2019, we got 87 days of grazing, again, uh, being having to end because of that drought. And when we started to look at average daily gain, uh, while there are some bold numbers, we really didn't see any major differences uh, in that average daily gain, especially just looking across these numbers when it comes to the different treatments. Uh, and so we do notice a few things. And one is regardless of treatment in the middle of the summer, it is hard for stalker animals to gain weight in South Georgia. And we know that it gets very hot, especially when they're very hot and stressed out, but they can gain. Um, but really, regardless of what they're, they're eating, if you're getting one to two pounds during that time period, uh, that you're doing pretty good. But the big component that stuck out uh, each year is looking at the gain per acre, as well as looking at our stocking rate. And you see those highlighted numbers with the addition of that legume in the mixture, we were able to maintain a higher stocking rate, thus have a higher gain per acre. So while the results didn't really show up uh, in that average daily gain, uh, it really uh, speaks volumes when you, you look at these particular numbers uh, with using that alfalfa Bermuda grass mixture. So again, uh, we found that the advantage went to the mixture, and we believe after this work that these are definitely a viable option for our southeastern stalker cattle producers, especially those that are looking to reduce the use of synthetic nitrogen sources uh, in their pastures to maintain their higher quality Bermuda grass. Uh, and I know that not everyone does this, but a legume is definitely an excellent way for us to uh, improve the yield and quality of our stand uh, without having to use a lot of those synthetic uh, fertilizer sources. The other implication that we uh, learned, and I think we knew this, but we definitely have the data now for it, is that when you get into a, a significant drought, our rest periods were not long enough. Three splits were not enough because when we had seven to 10 great days of grazing and sometimes only 14 days of rest um, in a drought, the, the uh, forage did not have time to recover. So we really needed to get closer to that 28 day time period or, or so we thought. So that led us to our next project. And this is actually a tri-state project with the University of Georgia, Auburn University and the University of Florida where we looked at developing our grazing recommendations. Uh, when we started looking back in the literature, there's a lot of information on alfalfa. There's a lot of information on Bermuda grass. There's very little information on alfalfa and Bermuda grass mixtures. And so we felt that there was a deficit in some of the information for us to best develop management practices for our producers. The other thing that we noticed is that when giving these grazing recommendations, a lot of times the data told you to go to a certain height or graze for a certain frequency, uh, but we never could find something that really focused on both components. And, and we understand why it's very challenging. And so we decided that we were gonna have evaluation where we evaluated three different heights, as well as uh, three different frequencies uh, to determine what those best recommendations are. Now, I have the, the mock curve here, but really it's because we can always look at what can get us the maximum yield, and we can look at what can get us the maximum quality. But what we're looking at is where can we find the optimum? And so that's what this evaluation was about, is determining where that optimum point was to, to get the best yield quality and stand longevity uh, and really have that, that alpha alpha be persistent for more than just a small time period. And so uh, again, I mentioned we did two, four and six inches and two, four and six weeks is our evaluation. If you can look here on the harvest height and our harvest frequency. And we know that as, uh, as time goes that, you know, you're gonna have a higher yield and you're gonna have a lower quality. And there's lots of information that shows that our trends uh, for our quality follow much like our trends for our yield did. Uh, but when we wanted to identify that optimum, it was at the four inch height at a four week frequency. And that uh, really follows with what we're continuing to do. And what our recommendations are is to allow for a minimum of 28 days of rest before getting back onto these mixtures and grazing no lower than four inches when you are uh, harvesting these. Now, uh, I know we can show a lot of numbers and graphs, but really uh, I'm a visual learner. And so uh, this was in the end of uh, 2018, September of 2018. And this is a four inch, four week interval that we were talking about. And it looks as if there's not a lot of alfalfa out there. Um, 
I had a very concerned grad student at the end of this year, uh, but I said, you know, hold off because we'd watched what had happened in the Bailage and maybe uh, this is going to respond in the same way. So in January of 2019, as you can see, we had nice green rows of alfalfa that were re-emerging uh, in that four inch four uh, week harvest interval. In May, we have a really good stand of alfalfa as well as some of our volunteer forages. Uh, some people call them weeds. I call that a high quality annual ryegrass that uh, got into that mixture. And so then we began, May was when we started that season's harvest and then we began harvesting throughout. And by the end of the second year in October, uh, again, you see that very clear alfalfa in that mixture. And so this is what we're looking for, for that ideal stand persistence that you still get that good mix of that Bermuda grass and that alfalfa. And so we've been, we were very pleased with the, the results that we found. Uh, and it, as I mentioned, uh, we determined four inches and a 28 to 30 day uh, rest is gonna give you the optimum yields, not the highest, but the optimum yield uh, value and, uh, and stand persistence. So we took the information from that evaluation and we then uh, submitted another NEPA grant and we have this project is also ongoing and a collaboration between the University of Georgia, uh, Auburn University and the University of Florida. And in this particular um, project, we are evaluating for alfalfa Bermuda grass systems under uh, con contrasting defoliation management strategies. And so the three different management strategies that we're looking at are a cut system where we harvest for hay or baleage, depending on the weather, uh, throughout the entire uh, life of the project. Uh, we have a grazing system. So we do a clean off cut in the springtime period, and then we implement grazing. And we graze until we feel that we need to pull off for the rest of uh, the, the remainder of the year. Uh, and so that's a straight graze system. And then we have what we call as a cut and graze system. And with that, we do our early March cuts or our clean off cut. Uh, we implement grazing, but we pull off during that summer stress time period to allow the alfalfa to rest and to move the, the animals to another area where they potentially would be getting close to the same gains where it really is weather dependent on that when we figured that out. If we have ample rain, we're good. If we're in a drought situation, uh, we're, we're maybe not so good. And so uh, we do have some just preliminary data from that. And this is to show our location at Tipton. Uh, so we do have these large studies going on in Tipton, Georgia and Headland, Alabama. And as you can see, these are simultaneous, uh, you know, they're visuals. If you follow social media, I put pictures of these on Facebook all the time. Um, but it has our cut system and our gray system, so our various treatments. And it's very neat to be able to see the impacts of the different harvest strategies uh, on the stand at varying times of the year. And so it's giving us some very curious data. Um, so when we were managing these, from a grazing standpoint, we had our two and a half acre paddocks that we had four splits in this time. And each section is grazed for no more than seven days and at least a 28 day rest period before they come back to uh, this the first section. Uh, on our baleage, again, we harvest at that 10% bloom stage, except for that first cut at 25% bloom. We maintain a 28 to 35 day interval. We did get into a drought last year, and so we did notice that our July and August cuts had to be pushed to that 35-day interval uh, just uh, to get to our 10% bloom stage, uh, but it was still uh, good quality material whenever we harvested it uh, at that target of 55% moisture. And then on our cut and graze system, so we follow these strategies uh, throughout the system, but then we come back and we stockpile graze. So the areas where we pulled off, uh, we do a clean off cut and then we allow for stockpiling. And that's what you actually see uh, in this particular area. Um, and for this, we strip graze small sections. And while I say strips, uh, my, my student would laugh because they're not long strips, they're triangles and squares and, and whatever you can get because sometimes it's a very, very small area for the number of animals that we're using. They're allocated no more than two to three days of forage uh, based on their animal body weight and expected intake. Uh, one of the interesting things that we know, we expected this, but uh, we can't use frontal grazing, which we do typically use if we are grazing stock or Bermuda grass alone. And that's because we already noticed after about three days of rest, when we grazed our baleage areas or our uh, stockpile areas, 
Uh, we already saw greening up of these uh, semi to non-dormant alfalfas. And so because of that, if we allowed the animals to continue to walk over those areas that they'd already grazed, then they would have selected to graze those areas and not what we had stockpiled for them. And so it's very interesting data. We've been very excited about doing uh, that project. I don't know that my students is excited. He has a lot of work to do when he has to go out and move them, but it's always exciting for me to see. And so from our preliminary data in year one, uh, we didn't start grazing until the very end of May, beginning of June. And that's because again, that first year you wanna get to that 25% bloom stage and you want to allow uh, for, um, you want to allow for, the, for it to get to the growth that you're wanting, uh, as well as to have a clean off cut. And we did have some significant ryegrass in that clean off cut. Uh, so we did the clean off cut and we started grazing in between May and June. Uh, for our graze treatment, we grazed till up, right up until October, even though we had a significant drought and we thought we were going to have to pull them off. But having that 28 day interval uh, really helped us from uh, to get through that slump versus that uh, eight or 14 to 20 day that we had in the previous study. And then on our cut and graze, we were able to graze for about 42 days. So we grazed till mid July and then we pulled off to allow for um, that summer slump and the reset for stockpiling. And then we got another 42 days of grazing out of Tipton 85 uh, Bulldog 805 alfalfa on a stockpile system. And so that was pretty, uh, pretty exciting to see. We actually pulled off in Thanksgiving. We had more material, uh, but you know, sometimes you gotta take these things to market. Uh, so we did see again, just like our previous study, that average daily gain fluctuates throughout the season, and it's definitely an impact, uh, probably a combination impact of the contribution of alfalfa, but also that heat. Once we get to a certain uh, heat level in South Georgia, uh, you know, if you're getting one or two day or two pounds a day gain, you're doing pretty good. And so again, it fluctuated between one and a half to two pounds a day. And then our stockpile gains were about a half a pound a day. Uh, again, this is just first year data, uh, but it does follow with both of our recent work that uh, uh, we've looked at with stockpile Bermuda grass, specifically stockpile tipped in 85 Bermuda grass, as well as grazing of these uh, alpha alpha Bermuda grass mixtures in the summer. Uh, the other question was botanical composition. And so we have that evaluated and we looked at our different systems. And so we look in our Baelish system and we can see that it does, our alfalfa component did increase uh, June, July and August as we were going into that summer slump. So we are seeing that that is represented. Uh, it also is happening in our cut and graze treatment as well as our graze treatment. And we see that our alfalfa component is much less in that August. Uh, so if you think about the fact that in July and August, we had that drought impacting, we also still had animals out that were utilizing that forage at that time period. So this is not surprising. So then the question is, what is happening after these time periods? And we just did go out before we, uh, before we got started this year, and we did persistence estimates on each of these treatments. So we should have information here to see how uh, these plants recovered after having a, a winter rest period uh, before utilization uh, this year. And year two is off and running. So my graduate student uh, got started on Tuesday with the implementation of our project. And so we do have some steers out there that have started grazing uh, and the alfalfa is looking phenomenal. And we're pretty excited uh, about seeing uh, where the data takes us this year. We do have additional alfalfa projects and I could probably talk about alfalfa all day, but I'm not gonna do that. Uh, but some other things that we are looking at is the potential of using alfalfa for uh, to sustainably increase production in the Southeast and restore our grasslands or pastures. Uh, in this particular project, we've interceded alfalfa into both tall fescue and Bermuda grass sods in the spring and the fall time period. Now we do recommend fall planting of alfalfa into Bermuda grass uh, in our area, but we are looking at both uh, and, and the data, even the project already say the fall is working out better. And then we have the addition of crabgrass and a lot of people say, what, crabgrass, why? Uh, one of the biggest weeds that you'll tend to find in the summer, especially if you get into a drought situation is crabgrass. And so we've kind of gone with the mantra of, you know, why beat it or why, why fight it? Why not use it? And so we're looking at, well, what is that quality difference if you don't do anything about the crabgrass in your mixture? And this project has two locations in Georgia and then an additional location in Tennessee. 
We also have a comparison of legume options in Bermuda grass for baleage production. And that's where we took our bale alfalfa Bermuda grass baleage project from the, uh, the after the first three years. And in year four, we did a comparison to uh, Barduro red clover in Bermuda grass as an alternative uh, legume grass baleage option. And we did that evaluation for two years. And there's some pretty promising results. We're, we're hoping to have that information out soon. And then the next question is, what are the next steps in these mixtures and, and how do we answer the producer questions? Because now we figured out the best management practices for establishing and getting this here, but do the same rules apply for alfalfa production as alfalfa Bermuda grass production? And some of the questions that I get a lot are, how long after, quote, killing the alfalfa out do I wait before I can replant in the mixture? And can I overseed alfalfa into an existing stand? Uh, you know, do I need to be worried about the allelopathy of alfalfa? And so we have some preliminary projects just kind of looking at that and trying that out a little bit, uh, because that's definitely something we need to do from a risk standpoint, uh, you know, to get those answers for our producers. Um, rather than they, they having to, to take that risk. Now, if you are considering planting alfalfa in the region, we do have the alfalfa and Bermuda grass checklist as well as several other uh, alfalfa and Bermuda grass um, resources uh, on the Southeast Cattle Advisor webpage. So that is southeastcattleadvisor.com. We also have uh, videos on YouTube. You can just Google alfalfa in the South and we have several webinars workshops that we've put on uh, that can talk about the specifics of establishment, uh, things to consider on site selection, uh, pest control, just very, uh, very in depth. Uh, and if you would like to attend an Alfalfa in the South workshop in person, we are very hopeful uh, that uh, with the that COVID restrictions will be lifted uh, come September. And we are going to have an in-person Alfalfa in the South workshop at the Better Gracing program here in Tifton. Uh, where we actually had that ongoing uh, multi multiple default defoliation, sorry, management uh, project uh, currently ongoing. And with that, I will take any questions. I know that was a lot really fast. <laughs> All right, we do have uh, several questions. And uh, if you have something, please continue to add in the chat. Our first question, when you intercede the alfalfa into Bermuda grass, how challenging is it to manage weeds after that? So that is an excellent question. Um, we, uh, that, that is definitely a challenge that we face and depending on the type of winter you have is really gonna determine the presence of those winter weeds and the impact they're gonna have. Um, you know, in the past few years, we've had very warm and potentially wet uh, winters here in Tifton, and so weeds have become a greater issue. Uh, when you have a legume grass mixture, there's not a lot that you can do from a weed control standpoint, and then when you have a lot of moisture, you're even more limited. Uh, you know, you can use 2,4-DB on alfalfa, and it is tolerant to that, uh, just like a peanut plant is, uh, but the timing interval typically for 2,4-DB, because it doesn't, you know, you can't have a lot of rain after you uh, plant, I think it's like seven to 10 days, becomes a challenge. Uh, we also have Roundup Ready alfalfa that we have used in mixtures. And originally, uh, when I was looking at these mixtures from a grazing or hay standpoint, I didn't see the value of spending that much extra for Roundup Ready technology. However, having a couple failed stands <laughs> when I didn't have that technology uh, having Roundup in there really can help with the establishment, uh, and it can also shut down the Bermuda grass if it were to break dormancy and help to control some of those winter weeds. And so, actually, I've been kind of sold now just from that first year establishment on using uh, Roundup Ready alfalfa as an option in these mixtures. All right, next question. Uh, you talked on a little bit, but how long does the alfalfa stand persist and how often can you come back and oversee without disease issues building up? That is a very good question. And we get that one uh, uh, often. Uh, we've seen these mixtures uh, last for several, several years. And our mixture is still here. But I will say going into year six, it has thinned out. And so it really determines what your use is and what your goals are. And I'm curious as to knowing that because from a pure alfalfa stand, you know, you're looking at 
straight economic profitability, but are you losing as much money when the alfalfa is leaving in a mixture? Because you still have something out there to harvest. Uh, and, you know, one of the ways that people in pure alfalfa stands uh, improve that is to add a grass to it. And we already have the grass there. Uh, so we're not real sure on what the persistence will be. Um, if you get three years, our economic data, we do have an economic tool that you can, uh, that's linked to on the Southeast Cattle Advisor webpage that you can put your operation in to determine. Uh, but if you get to a three year stand, and that's where we really see the greatest uh, yields happening is in that third year, uh, you've gotten your money work, money back and uh, you're, you're, I guess, going good in the, in the out of the red. Um, so I, five years is, is pretty standard, and that's pretty standard for alfalfa production across the nation. Um, but we don't really know this is exactly how long it is definitely gonna, gonna last. On the interseeding question, um, I'm asking that question myself. Uh, there's a lot of data that suggests that uh, maybe if it's in a mixture that allelopathy is not gonna be as much of an issue. Uh, but we also see that there's a zone of influence. Uh, once you get outside of 12 inches from that parent plant, you don't have much of a concern. Well, we've tried this, planting it into our 14 inch row spacing. And if you straddle that 14 inch row spacing, you're at best seven inches away from that parent plant if that parent plant's still there. Uh, so we're actually gonna go collect some data tomorrow and see. Uh, so I guess the answer on that one is wait and see. and. Uh, Hopefully we have better answers than what we expect. Okay, next question. Uh, you talked about your hay study. Uh, the question was, are you using P and K fertilizer with your hay? But I, I guess the really best thing is kind of review again with us the way you manage the combination fertility. Yes. Um, so uh, we we don't obviously you don't have to put nitrogen in the mixture once you have your alfalfa. Uh, we have used it at the establishment stage sometimes to get it just a bump off the ground, but after that, we won't put nitrogen into the mixture. Uh, we add uh, phosphorus at whatever your soil test recommendations are, usually uh, in our first application throughout the year. Uh, we do molybdenum and boron starting our second year, uh, but most of the seed that you're going to buy right now has that seed coating and it has your starter needs for inoculant as well as molybdenum and boron so you don't have to worry about those in year one. The big kicker that we have to pay attention to is potash and so we put up to 300 units of potassium. Uh, we split up it three to four times across the season uh, and while that may seem like a lot when you look at the re recommendations for a hybrid Bermuda grass, the only difference when you compare alfalfa uh, yield and quality uh, recommendations, soil test recommendations to Bermuda grass soil, soil test recommendations is the nitrogen component. That high potash recommendation is there for both Bermuda grass uh, and alfalfa. So it, it's, you know, it's not like you're adding a whole lot extra, uh, but if you don't put that potash out there, uh, you're not going to have either one for very long. All right, next question. Uh... Since perennial peanut has a lot longer longevity, how does perennial peanut and Bermuda grass compare to the alfalfa mix? Well, now I don't do much work on perennial peanut. I'll leave that to Dr. Du uh, Duvet. But <laughs> um, so one of the, I, I get this question a lot. And um, some of the differences with alfalfa and perennial peanut obviously is the establishment uh, where perennial peanut is going to require several years and establishment from sprigs to get a really good stand going. Uh, alfalfa, you can put from seed. You can seed in the fall and start using it in the spring. Uh, and so you will have to reseed uh, after, you know, five years or so. Uh, and you wouldn't have to do that with perennial peanut. The other is uh, the variation in variety and dormancy ratings. And so uh, perennial peanut has a more limited uh, area that it is able to be grown. Uh, whereas we can grow alfalfa, uh, you know, in North Georgia, just as, as well as we can grow it down here in South Georgia. Uh, and so it's almost like, even though it seems like apples to apples, it's really more like an apples to oranges comparison. And I'm a fan of both, but. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, next question. What type of management do you recommend for the Bermuda grass prior to seeding the alfalfa? So the summer and fall uh, prior to seeding, 
the management, oh, the year before. Okay, so one, if you have the alfalfa Bermuda grass checklist, um, you can uh, go through that and it's gonna go through uh, your stand and site selection and it's gonna tell you things to look for. If you've used any herbicides with a long-term residual, especially a broadleaf control, like a graze on next, uh, you don't need to be planting alfalfa in that area for at least two years, um, just because you're gonna start out with a potentially failed stand. Um, the other thing that we recommend is looking at your soil test and looking at your pH and making sure that your pH is within the range, not just at the so soil level, but at the subsoil level. So usually when we talk with producers that are considering alfalfa Bermuda grass establishment, uh, we actually are starting that conversation now in the spring so that we can make sure that the management throughout the year uh, fits what we're, what we're looking for for successful establishment. All right, so in the grazing uh, of the mix, um, when, it, when it comes to the grazing of the mix, um, how long do you have to wait before, uh, you know, after you're, you've interceded, how long do you have to wait before you start grazing the first time? Um, so we actually uh, treat it the same as we do our baleage treatments, uh, our baleage study. So we would wait until we got to that 25% bloom. Uh, this year we did a clean off cut and then we started grazing and we got delayed a little bit. And so if you looked at our, uh, our gain data just from that first month, it didn't look great. But we were also, by the time that we got to that fourth rotation, uh, that, that material was 50 something days old uh, from that clean off cut. So our first rotation through, you're going to see some variations in the quality that you're not going to see once you start your second rotation. Uh, but we really, once you get to the 25% bloom stage, you could start grazing there uh, effectively. So uh, we, we started grazing, it's April, it's April and we're grazing. So, you know, that first year, it's not going to be till May for sure. All right, next question in your grazing system, are you using any bloat control? Yes, so we do uh, multiple things just for, uh, for bloat, just bloat prevention. Uh, we do provide a mineral with uh, monensin in it just as a potential bloat blocker. Uh, when we put them out onto treatment on the study, we wait until the afternoon. We make sure that they're not hungry, the forage is not wet. And we follow all of those standards to help decrease bloat. Uh, but one of the biggest advantages is even right now when uh, Bermuda grass is not making a lot of contribution. There's still ryegrass or there's other grasses that are out there in that mixture. So they're not grazing pure Bermuda grass alone without any other options. Uh, but we do use uh, a, a blow blocker. Okay, next question. Are you broadcasting or drilling in the potassium? The potassium, we broadcast. Uh, the, I was going to say the seed, we definitely are drilling that in. Uh, that's for your greater success, uh, for sure, and to get that 14-inch row spacing. Uh, but for our uh, potash applications, we have been broadcasting that. All right, and the, the next question is kind of a comment more than a question, but they're curious about your weed designation on crabgrass. In my yard, it's a weed in my field's pure summertime gold, uh, but it's expensive to plant. Have you all looked at planted uh you know, some of the improved varieties of um, crabgrass and alfalfa. So we actually planted a lot of crabgrass today. Um, so we, I'm a fan of crabgrass and, you know, I, I've tried to decide if I could just get some cows in my yard to help control mine there too. Um, but uh, we have not, uh, we're, we're looking at, we're going to be using Mojo crabgrass so when we put the integration into our alfalfa Bermuda grass mixture to get us some of that um, data to, to try to figure, you know, to get some quantification of that. Uh, but we are pretty, uh, I guess, lucky um, that we have a uh, crabgrass that does emerge pretty readily on its own in drought conditions down here. Uh, I have been impressed. I've used Mojo crabgrass se several times now. It is, uh, it's the only coated variety of crabgrass and we've been impressed so far with our results on that. All right, and the final question, do you see a lot of uh, selection for the alfalfa and the mixture when you're grazing, do they, is that a challenge with it? Um, it's really dependent. Uh, so with our mixture right now, we have a pretty good, uh, I guess a pretty good mix for lack of better terms. So when they go to take a bite of alfalfa, they're getting 
uh, Bermuda grass or whatever grass component as well. And so we have definitely adjust our stocking using foot and tag stocking to make sure that we're not going to overgraze that alfalfa component. Uh, but it really, you watching it go throughout the season or when you get to that maturity is when you see uh, that they may not be selecting the alfalfa as much as you would anticipate or what we would all think uh, as it being the highest quality option. Now, we do have some areas where we were grazing during the drought, and you can definitely see the impacts this year. Uh, there is less alfalfa uh, on those particular paddocks in the hardest uh, part of the year. Dr. Tucker, we certainly appreciate uh... All your good information. One of the questions is always, okay, I want to know more about this. Uh, the best place to start is to contact your local county agent in whatever state you reside. And um, and we'll try to connect you and we can certainly get up with Dr. Tucker and Dr. Dubay and all the folks that are working on forage legumes.